Hi everyone, in this video I'll be explaining day 18 of Advent of Code 2022. I know I said I would be pausing videos for a bit, but I just couldn't resist looking at the puzzles for today, and they were fairly straightforward, they weren't as challenging, nearly as challenging as day 17 and 16, so I actually did manage to place on the global leaderboard today, getting ranked 99, almost missing that on part 1, and 52. Um, on part two. So I think part of this is because I used Python. So uh, I could type the code pretty fast and I didn't have to worry too much about, you know, data structures, like types and all of that manipulation stuff because Python is amazing and you can do basically anything with it using very concise code. So, and it doesn't run too slowly either. Part two did run about 15 seconds for me, maybe more, um, but I think my code is reasonably efficient. Anyways, in this video, I'll be going over my solutions and my thought process and my code. If you want to check out my code, that's going to be linked down in the description, so be sure to check that out. Um, but anyways, let's get started with the explanations. Okay, so the story for today is that we are now um, exiting the volcano. The elephants and us have managed to navigate the maze of caves and finally leave. Um, but now there, there is a lava flow, the volcano has erupted, and some of the lava is cooling to form obsidian. Uh, we scan the obsidian, and it's formed a 3D grid, sort of like Minecraft, but basically we have these cubes, these blocks that are in 3D space, and our task is to find the total surface area of all of these boxes. So in this example, um, we have a box at 222, 122, 322, etc. Um, I might start calling these cubes, uh, or blocks, um, but basically there are 10 exposed squares on the outside. Um, of this structure. So the basic idea that I did was take a set and first insert all of these cubes into the set, all of these blocks um, into the set, instead of using like a 3D array or grid. I just thought using a set would be easier because I didn't know how large the input would be. Turns out um, the input is actually not that large. The coordinates don't exceed 19 for me and they're all um, non-negative. Anyways, I still wanted to use a set just to contain all of the blocks, uh, but basically we just loop through all the blocks check their neighbors, um, if they're each of their six neighbors on each of the faces, and if that neighbor is filled, then we do not add that square to the total, otherwise we do. So to loop through the neighbors, I went through the x, y, and z coordinates um, by iterating from 0 to 2, inclusive, and then changed those uh, coordinate locations from a 0 to either a 1 or a negative 1 to represent a change from our current location. So as we're looping through all the blocks, we can determine their six neighbors or the coordinates of their six neighbors. We can check if that neighbor is filled by a block of obsidian. If it is, then we increment this covered variable. So at the end of this loop, we will have covered equaling the number of neighbors that are filled by obsidian. Um, we want to subtract that from six to see the number of exposed squares that do not have um, filled neighbors next to them. And then those uh, available or open squares can be added to our total to calculate the surface area. So part one, pretty standard. Part two um, is a little bit more involved. So what we have to do for part two is it turns out that there are some pockets, some air pockets that are uh, contained or trapped inside the structure. So inside this uh, example, the blocks of obsidian trap one empty square or cube or voxel at 225. So this area uh, has six blocks of obsidian surrounding it that are blocking it. Um, but we're still counting all of those six squares in our sur surface area calculation. We actually don't want to do that. So part two asks us to only count the external uh, surface area of this structure. So to do this, um, what I did was do the same set thing. We insert all of these coordinates into a big set. This is probably not the most efficient considering that um, all of these lines slide a 19 by 19, 19 by 19 box for me. Um, but this was the fastest method that came to mind. So I just ran with it. The idea here is that we want to do basically the same thing. We want to count the number of exposed square for each cube but we don't want to count the squares that are like not able to reach the outside. So essentially we're taking every cube and we're looking at its six neighbors and trying to get outside by doing a depth first search. And if that neighbor can be exposed to the outside without running into like other blocks and being trapped, then we add one to the total. The most important bit here is to write this function, which takes a coordinates of a cube and sees if it, it can reach the outside. So we do this using a depth first search. And I'll just walk through each of the components. The main bit is this uh, while loop that does this stack that actually does the DFS. Um, but anyways, I'm going to refactor this a little bit. So we start with a stack. Usually um, when you do a DFS, you do a stack. You could also do this recursively, but I thought a stack would be easier. Uh, this is going to contain all of the cubes that we are yet to process. While the stack is non-empty, uh, we go through and we check if it has been, if the top element in the stack has been checked already. If, if it has, then we can ignore it. Otherwise, we add it uh, down here. 
Um, our stop condition is actually to check if it's outside the box. So my box is 19 by 19 by 19. You might have to modify uh, this variable. Actually, let me just refactor it for a second. Anyways, as we do the DFS, our stop condition is to check if any of the coordinates have reached the outside of our bounding box. And our bounding box can be computed by going through all the coordinates, like literally all of the numbers, and checking their minimum and maximum. In my case, minimum is 0, maximum is 19. If at any point in our DFS we have reached a point that is on the outside of our bounding box, then we're good to go and can return true to say that this position is exposed to the outside. Otherwise, we keep going. Um, I copy and pasted some of the code down here to check all six neighbors of the current cube and add each of those to the DFS stack. If, you have, if any of those neighbors are filled, then eventually we will get rid of them um, using this line, but it doesn't matter too much for efficiency whether we stop early or not. Okay, so now we have a function that can take in any position in 3D space within our bounding box and return whether it is exposed to the outside. Um, we do have to cache this, so I'm using the Python LRU cache it is a very useful method, or I, I don't know what this thing is, like a directive, this ampersand symbol in Python that lets you just cache literally any function with hashable inputs. So I use that because we're going to have a lot of repeated um, computations here. Actually, what we could do is make this recursive. Okay, but you know what? I'm not going to bother with that. Refactoring code um, is too much for me right now. And it's just unnecessary. Um, we can just DFS with stacks without recursion because recursion is going to be kind of expensive with the overhead of you know functions calling each other. Anyways, now that we have this function, uh, we can just go through all of the coordinates, check their six neighbors if those neighbors are exposed to the outside. And by the way, uh, a position is not exposed if it's already filled. So that's our condition up here. Um, you know, if the parameter passed into this function is already containing lava or obsidian, I forgot which one it was, then it is not exposed. So we go through all the neighbors using the same method as in part one, all six of them, and check if that uh, square is exposed, that cube is exposed. If so, we add one to our answer. Note that exposed returns a Boolean, but we cast it to an integer in this calculation over here since ants is an integer. Okay, and that's the basic idea for to how I solve today's puzzles. Um, part one was just a set neighbor checking calculation, pretty standard, and part two uh, used some DFS, so that was exciting. Overall, pretty satisfied with my performance today because um, I did make it to the global leaderboard. Day 16 and 17 I am still doing, so uh, expect to see a video sometime in the future. I won't say when. These puzzles are pretty challenging. I know you all look, are looking forward to explanations, so uh, stay tuned for explanatory videos on those days. Regardless, I hope today's video was helpful for explaining day 18. It was a relatively simpler puzzle, but I hope uh, seeing my thought process and my code did help a little bit. A reminder, if you do want to see my code, that's going to be linked below in the description in the GitHub repository, which contains my code to all previous puzzles. Also, I have a private leaderboard just as a reminder if you want to check it out. Um, there are now uh, 73 people on here, and we have someone who has overtaken me. Um, I won't try to pronounce your name exactly, but congratulations uh, on completing all the puzzles so far. That is a impressive feat, but do join. I'll leave the code to join my private leaderboard in the description below. So as always, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, feel free to leave it down below, and I'll see you tomorrow, uh, hopefully for day 19, but no um, necessary ex expectations there. Today's video was a sort of one-off because the puzzles were doable, um, but I expect they will get much more uh, challenging in the next few days. So I'll let you all know when I start um, expecting frequent uploads again. All right, that's it. Um, goodbye.